don't leave. Don't, this is the title of the message. It's not, it's not uh, something that I'm telling you about the service. So, uh, let's start by reading a scripture uh, in John chapter uh, 19 in verse 30. It says, when he had received the drink, he was at the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So this is the work of Jesus Christ at the cross. At the cross, he said, it is finished. Not that his life was ending and he was saying, it's finished, it's over. But the sense and the meaning of this expression, it is finished, it's, it's accomplished. I did it. It's a shout of victory. It's not a shout of defeat. It's not when somebody gets to the end of their life and they're in a hospital bed and they say, oh, it is finished. No, it's not the same sense that what Jesus was saying was, it is done. It's accomplished. And you know what he did for you at the cross for you and me? He paid the price for our, for our sins. And because he paid the price, we will not suffer everlasting death, separation from God, but we receive a free gift from God, which is everlasting life. And this doesn't make much sense. This is why, <coughs> excuse me, the Bible says also in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. So, this is kind of foolish. I remember the first time somebody told me, oh, he died for your sins. I said, this doesn't make sense to me. And I used to go to churches, to Roman Catholic churches. My family was Roman Catholic. And I used to see, uh, you know, images of Jesus suffering. And I, I used to look at that suffering. And it, I know we all suffer. And they were telling me he was suffering for you. And I, I was asking, why? You, because it didn't make sense to me. It was foolishness. How come the death of a man... You know, a, a, a Jewish man in a small town in the other end of the world. How come the death of that man contributed for my good? It's foolishness. So today, I'm going to travel with you through seven declarations that Jesus Christ did at the cross to try to clarify if you still think it's foolishness, to make it look more clear. The work of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, uh, I'll go very quickly through these declarations. But first, let me talk about a very special tree that is, exists in California. I love to go to California. Our assistant pastor is packing tonight uh, uh, from our church in Greenfield Park to go to California. I love to go there. And uh, there is this tree in California. It's called uh, Journal Sherman. It's the name of the tree. And they say it's the biggest tree in the world. It's quite large. Have you ever seen a tree like this? No. You, you've seen this tree? Oh, I would love to see this tree. Uh, how high is it? <laughs> Very high. You feel like an ant. <laughs> you feel like an ant close to the tree. So big it is. Now, this is the biggest tree in the world. Today, I want to share about a tree which is bigger than this one. And the name of that tree is the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the biggest wood in, or the biggest tree in the world. The tree of Calvary. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born as a man, gave himself for you and me at that cross. The same that said, it is finished, he gave himself. Because the Bible, the Word of God, uh, has several laws in the Old Testament. But Jesus Christ came to manifest God's grace. And one of the laws said that a person hanging on a tree or a wood as a punishment uh, is a, an accursed person. So the Bible says cursed is he that is hanged on the wood. And Jesus Christ made himself a curse for you and me. To pay a, a very special price that none of us could pay. Now, when he was at the cross, he did some statements or declarations. The first declaration he made was, Father, forgive them, for they uh, know not what they do. This is in Luke 23, 24. 
Jesus showed compassion for the people that were there killing him. This is why it's so important to know the declarations that led to that last one. It is finished. God loved so much, not only uh, abstract people and people like you and me, that he didn't met personally, but he was able to forgive those that were over there in front of him, crucifying him and killing him. So he was asking God to have compassion on them. Now I have children, and if someone attacks my children, I, I get very upset. Are you following me? You like to protect your kids, right? Yes. If someone tries to kill one of my children, they need to kill me first. Now this is God, the creator of the universe and the whole world. His son is there, born as a human being and being killed by his own creation. God could have, have just blinked or just blown and the whole earth will be destroyed. Here's Jesus at the cross, showing the deep love he has for all of us, saying, Father, forgive. And some people don't understand the principle of forgiveness. And uh, let me tell you this story about a barber. There was this barber cutting the hair to a preacher. And, and uh, he was an atheist. And uh, so he was telling the, the preacher, well, there's a loving God. How can God allow all this poverty, the suffering, all the things that go on in this world. And the preacher was there sitting on the chair. You know, he looked to the outside and there, there was this man passing by. And, and uh, uh, this man had, you know, scanty hair uh, and, uh, you know, uh, all unshaven. And the minister pointed to the man and, and said, uh, you know, why don't you fix the hair on that man? Why don't you take care of that man? And the barber said, well, I could, but he never gave me an opportunity. So the preacher told the barber, you see, that's exactly what the gospel is all about. Now God is willing to change the lives of the people, but they don't give him an opportunity. You know, God uh, is, is sovereign, but He allows us to make a decision. And like that barber who you cannot, you know, fix all the, <laughs> the unshaven uh, hair, uh, people and hair and, uh, and beards of the world, God is waiting on us to tell Him, Here am I. Here am I, Lord. Just as I am. And we need to receive forgiveness. We need to forgive. Uh, also, those people that are trying to ruin our life. The second declaration of the cross, uh, it's in Luke 23, 43, and Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he said this to one of the thieves that were being crucified with him. Today you shall be with me in paradise. And we have struggles in, in life. We have so many things that, you know, put us down. We have sufferings as, as our life progresses and we'll have sickness and infirmity and all sorts of things that happen to all of us. We're not getting stronger on the contrary, but we know this. One day we will be with Jesus Christ in paradise. This makes the difference between someone who accepts God's love and someone who rejects His love. Right there at the cross. On both sides, there were two men being punished for something wrong. They were, they were receiving death penalty. And one was mocking of Jesus. But the other one was saying, this is a righteous man. And, and he, he begged to Jesus, Jesus, re re remember me. Remember when you enter into your kingdom. And he said, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, the assurance that I have this foolishness of the cross that I've received by faith, I know that if I die today, I will be with the Lord Jesus Christ in paradise. This is the most important thing. You know, having money, cars, you know,
know, uh, uh, having nice things. We all like these things. It's not a sin to have nice things. But our main goal in life should be truly to, to have this blessed assurance that we'll be with the Lord in paradise. Uh, some people don't see this. Now, the third declaration, he said in Matthew 27, 46, to record this declaration, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Jesus Christ felt abandoned in that moment. Because he that had the power to just blow and destroy the whole world. You see, when they came to arrest him in the, in the garden where he was praying, he, he just said, here am I. And the soldiers that came to arrest him fell on the ground. He had the power just by his word to destroy everything around, around him. But he decided to pay the, the price for you and me. And as he was there hanging on the cross, he felt abandoned. Why? Because the Holy Spirit departed from, from him. You see, we, we can walk with God and the Holy Spirit is in us, but if we decide to go back to sin, the Holy Spirit leaves. And right there, the Holy Spirit had to leave because he there, he took upon himself, you know, the sin and the misery and, and, and all the sin of the world was upon him. So he felt abandoned. He felt like God had left him. I don't know if you ever felt like this. There are situations in life. I felt this many times in life. I'm glad that since I walk with, with God, uh, it, it's not often that I feel that God abandoned me. But sometimes I also feel, you know, what happened, God? Why is this happening? Why did you allow this to happen in my life? But you see, uh, Jesus Christ had his trust in the Father. And we need to have the same kind of trust. We need to trust in God. And, the, you know, let, let me give you an example. I don't know how many of you like dogs or animals. I have a very stubborn dog. I have a hound a dog. It's a hunting dog. And the hounds are very, very stubborn. So I cannot teach him tricks. I have previously had other dogs, and I could teach tricks, but my basset hound, you know, those with the long ears, you know, big dog, it's a huge dog. I cannot teach many tricks. I teach a few. You know, sit down. <laughs> That one I was able, but not much, to be honest. But, uh, but with dogs, you know, it's possible to teach dogs. And there, there are two schools on how to teach dogs. And usually there was a, a philosophy for a, a, a training uh, in, in which you will punish the dog. You know, if you don't obey me, you're going to suffer the consequence. And you know what? This works. This works. We can train a dog like this. And I've seen dogs training like this. With violence, and it works. They obey. They put the tail between their legs, and they obey. But there's another way, which is rewarding the dog when the dog does something good. And you know what? It works too. So both these, uh, these uh, ways of training the dog work. But they produce very different types of dogs. Now, why am I talking about this? See, in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual things, there are also two types of Christians. There are people that follow God because they're afraid that God is going to, to, do, to punish them. And there are those that follow God and they trust in His reward when they do something good. Can you see the difference? <laughs> you see, when, when, you, when you have the, those, these dogs that are trained in different ways, the first dog can become very violent and they can even bite the owner. When you, when you come constantly punish a dog, I, I know because I've seen this, uh, I, I've, uh, I've suffered the consequences of being <laughs> uh, attacked by dogs that were trained this way. But if you train a dog with a reward, you have a very different kind of, of animal. Now, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. And some people that have a religious mindset, they see a God that is always willing and ready to punish them. They, if you do something wrong, God is going to punish you. And they have this philosophy. But we should, should know that God loves us so much. He doesn't want to punish us. In fact, He wants to reward us when we do good. So the way we walk with the Lord will determine, you know, the how are we going to see Jesus and how are we going to obey Him? If we are the kind of person 
that has a, 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 a fear of God which is not healthy, not the fear of God that is the beginning of wisdom, but that they're constantly afraid of God, then when something happens, they abandon God. They say, God, you have forsaken me, I forsake you too. But you see, if we cultivate love for God, if we decide to do good for the Lord, then when the bad circumstances, circumstances come into our lives, we can move forward because we know our God. Now the fourth declaration, Jesus was there with the, uh, his mother and John was there and he said, Woman, behold thy son and behold thy mother. Jesus, even in a time of great suffering, he was uh, loving and compassionate for those he loved. And he took care of Mary, his mother. And he, he, he was concerned. See, he always said seven things at the cross. There were, there were, there, it was a long period of time, many hours at the cross. And he said seven things. They are so, so important. And, um, and for 33 years, Mary took care of Jesus. A mother has a special kind of love for, for, for her son. And here is, uh, here is a, a moment when a mother is seeing that he, uh, his, uh, her son being punished, chastised, dying. She knew the end result would be death. But here is Jesus. And Jesus wasn't just a great prophet, <coughs> wasn't just a great teacher, wasn't just the Son of God. Jesus Christ was also the virgin-born Son of God, our Savior. And he was able to take care of the ones he loved. Also at the cross, he said, I thirst. Let's not forget he was human. Some people think, well, he was God. So he, he didn't suffer like us. Yes, he did. He was human enough to acknowledge uh, his need. And you know what? He is also willing to acknowledge your need. Because he suffered just like one of us. He can identify with you in your suffering. So when you have a suffering, when you have a problem, when you feel betrayed, when you feel that the world is upside down, you have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in heaven. He, re he resurrected. Amen. And he's willing to take care of you. And he will. You know, uh, when we talk about uh, water, it's, it's interesting. Let me give you a few facts about the water. The human, the human body is two-thirds water. No. Can you imagine two-thirds uh, of what you see, what you see around? Two-thirds of yourself is water. Isn't that amazing? And uh, the body absorbs cold water, positive hot water. By the, the time you're 70 years old, you have required 5 million liters of water. 5 million liters of water. Just to drink. I'm not talking about washing. Because that's even, even, even more. And if you lose 2% of your body's water supply, your energy will decrease 20%. And at 10% decrease, you'll be unable to walk, and 20% you're dead. So here's Jesus Christ with a very specific need. Because it's hot, it's Jerusalem, it's even warmer than Montreal. <laughs> and here's Jesus dehydrated at the cross. And he has this physical need. You know, Jesus Christ is able to take care of our needs. Now, the sixth declaration of the cross, it is finished. And again, we're not yet finishing our service, but only a person that knows where he's going can say, I got to the end. This is my destination. See, sometimes we can go on a trip without knowing the destination. I did this several times. I don't know if you ever tried this. When I, I was a little bit younger, our kids were small, and I used to, to uh, leave for vacation with my wife. We, we had a minivan, and we, we would say, okay, let's go to France. And we would drive to France. And then we would drive to France and say, now let's go to Spain. And <laughs> we'll go to Spain. Now let's go to Germany. And we had vacations like this. It was very exciting, not knowing where we were going. <laughs> We found that we would look into the map, there was no GPS or computers at the time, so we had to look into a map and to see what are we going to see next, where are we going next day. Very excited to do vacations like this. But, uh, but 
certain uh, things in our life have to be planned. Do you have your life planned? Do you have it figured out? One day we will meet the Creator. Do you have it figured out? Or is it an unplanned thing? Are you going to think, well, when I, when I die, then we'll see what happens. It shouldn't be like this. We can plan. And the way to plan is so simple. It's just asking the Lord Jesus to forgive for our sins. And say, God, here I am, just as I am. And, and God will accept you with his love. He will guide you. He will reveal himself to you. He's not a distant God. He's right here. And he, he's willing to do miracles in our life, to change our lives. I've seen God doing so many miracles in my own life and in the lives of others. And I continue to see those miracles. Just last month when they brought the, this sick baby uh, uh, to our church and we, we came, uh, uh, the father came with the baby to the front and we prayed for the baby. And the baby didn't have an eardrum, was born without eardrum. And God gave the baby a, an eardrum. <laughs> Praise God. I couldn't do this. But we just prayed. And we just asked. Uh, that, that, that young man is a, he's an evangelist, a Spanish evangelist. I hope to invite him to come here once with the lady. And, uh, and he just cried so much. He was so touched because he said, I know the Lord heals. I prayed for my son for a year and a half. Nothing happens. Nothing happened. But in this special day that I came with faith, the Lord healed my baby. God is willing to heal us, to change our lives. I've seen people transformed. I see people, they, they, they were drunk all their lives and they came to know the Lord Jesus and they were delivered from addiction, from drugs, from alcohol, and other prosperous people. God loves us, but we need to have it figured out. You know, it is finished. Be assured there's a purpose at the end. And the last word that Jesus said at the cross, and we're going to, to finish, into your hands I commit my spirit. So this was, this was the seventh declaration from the cross. Into thy hands, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And uh, we, we know that uh, we walk in a narrow path when we walk with the Lord. And God is always willing to take control of our lives. As, as long as we say, into your hands I commit my spirit. All that I am, I give it to you. That, that's what, 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 it, what it means to give our lives to God. It's not just a prayer that we do in a church. But it's one day deep from within our hearts we say, you know what, I've lived long enough making my own plans and failing all the time. I've lived long enough in desperation. I've lived long enough with these burdens. Now I decide, God, I'm going to give you my life. And I'm going to do this invitation. But as we conclude this service or this message, let me tell you this story about this man that was uh, walking uh, in, in the woods and he fell to a ravine and he grabbed a, a branch and uh, as if he was hanging there for his life, he started to uh, yell for help. Help, help, help. And, but nobody would listen to the man. And he was there just crying he couldn't uh, uh, come out of that situation uh, down, he, you know, he was facing certain death. And uh, after he was there for a while, he listened to a voice calling his name. He said, I'm here, I'm here. Who are you? Where are you? And the voice said, I am God. Do you trust me? And he said, God, yes, I trust you. God said, if you trust me, just let go. And he waited for a while. And finally he said, is there anyone else out there? <laughs> <laughs> you see, we say we trust in the King God. But eventually we'll get to a situation in life which is just might not be that you're hanging on a cliff. It might be that you have an incurable disease. It might be that you have a problem in your family that you don't know how to 
say, let go. I'll take the chance of the situation for you. Just let go. And this is my challenge for you today. I don't know the circumstances of your life. I know I've been through a lot of difficult ones, and I'm sure all of us here know what, what is to face adversity. But today I want to challenge you to trust God. I finished by telling you a story from the, the Old Testament. And uh, this story is a true story about the people of Israel. And the people of Israel were walking to their promised land. And uh, uh, there was an army from another nation. They were called the Amalekites that attacked the people of Israel. So Moses, Aaron, and, and Hur went to the top of a cliff. And, uh, and down there in the valley, the troops were fighting against each other. And the Bible says that whenever Moses lifted his hands with a, with a, 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 a rod, with a, that piece of wood, uh, God's people will uh, win the battle. But then he became tired, and as he let, let his hands go down, the Israelites started to lose the battle. So again, he would put the hands down, but finally, what they decided to do, they decided to help Moses to hold the, the rod. And I can imagine, you know, the Malachites down in the valley looking up and say, what are those guys doing? <laughs> what are they doing? What a stupid thing. They were all here fighting. Isn't that a stupid thing? You know, they're on the top of the mountain. Everybody's fighting. There's blood all over. You know, they're fighting for their lives. And, and there's this old man with a piece of wood in his hand. You know? <laughs> and the Amalekites were probably thinking, what do they think they're doing? But each time he lifted that piece of wood, there was victory. Now, do you remember the verse we started with? You know, that says that for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. You know, what kind of foolishness is this? Let me give you a very practical application to our lives. The cross of Jesus Christ is this piece of wood that we can lift high. And when we lift the cross of Jesus Christ, we receive victory in our lives. Whenever we get tired and we say, oh, you know, I'm tired, I'm tired, uh, go to church, you know, I'm tired of going to church, you know, praying, I don't want to pray, you know, uh, reading the Bible, I'm, you know, I, I've been busy all day working, I have so many things to do, it's when we let go that then we can see the power of the enemy defeating our lives. So then we need our prayers, that's why we come to church. Because as we come to church, we'll have people that will help us to lift up the cross of Jesus Christ. Just like Moses had those two that contributed to the victory of the whole people. We all need to have friends and we find them at church. Those people that when we are despair, when we're feeling low, when we're struggling with things that are beyond our capacity, can help us to lift up the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give a hand of applause to the Lord. I'm going to invite you all to stand. And I would like to pray for you. And as I told you right at the beginning of the service, I would like us, uh, I'd like to pray for everyone that is in, in special need. And uh, and if you have a, a special need of prayer, you know, just come forward. Just come forward now. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask Pastor Eric also to 